of this evening, we come to consider this wonderful servant of the Lord of the 18th century revival, George Whitfield. And we're continuing then in this uh, series of lectures wherein we have been tracing the progress of the work of the gospel right from the earliest centuries of the Christian era, and we've reached the 18th century revival. And the method of treatment has very largely been, in part, a, a biographical sketch of the person concerned and a discussion of some important theological matters of continuing concern to us. And in that way, we learn something about God's work in a person by his spirit. And we also learn something of the truth of the word of God, of the greatest possible relevance to us. Now, George Whitfield was preeminently an evangelist. He was a preacher of the gospel. And there's no doubt that he's one of the greatest of all time. In earlier lectures, I've expressed his eminence by saying uh, what Hugh Latimer was in the 16th century and what Richard Baxter was in the 17th century, what Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones has been to the 20th century, Spurgeon to the 19th, George Whitfield was to the 18th century. That kind of stature is his. And it's very fitting, therefore, that we should consider such a great servant of God. And yet, I think it's true to say that still in many people's reckoning, uh, he is little known for reasons that I'll touch on in just a moment. I first became acquainted with him through a film which was produced in the 1950s by religious films called John Wesley. You've all heard of him. And in the film, this character appears somewhat in the background as a friend of the Wesley brothers and later on as a pioneer open-air preacher in Bristol. And that's just about the sum total of his appearance in that film which is devoted to John Wesley. And it was before I was converted that I first saw that film. So I remembered him when, after my conversion, I saw the film again and was further aroused and interested in this man, George Whitfield. By then I'd read some biographies of Wesley and he, uh, Whitfield had occurred in those biographies. And one was aware of a theological debate between John Wesley and George Whitfield, which added interest as well. And eventually one came to know something of George Whitfield. I then attended a Christian camp down in Cornwall and to my absolute delight, I found on the bookstore this particular volume, pub first published in 1958, called Select Sermons of George Whitfield, which is still in print in paperback form and published by the Banner of Truth Trust. And it has this splendid biographical introduction by Bishop J.C. Ryle. It comes, in fact, from his fuller work entitled uh, Christian Leaders of the 18th Century. And Whitfield occurs in pole position, one might say, uh, in that particular book. And uh, it is a splendid introduction to the life and to the ministry and the influence of the great George Whitfield. I can't forget either that uh, in those early years of my own Christian life, I started then going around second-hand bookshops uh, and going into such a shop in Guildford, came across a dusty old volume on the floor by a James Patterson Gladstone called George Whitfield Field Preacher, published about the turn of this century. And I was so excited by this book, I even wrote away to the publisher of this volume, The Banner of Tooth Trust. I wrote off to uh, the Reverend Ian Murray, even suggesting in my audacity and youthful temerity that they might like to republish that particular volume, as I knew they were republishing old volumes. But he kindly wrote back to me to explain that a new biography was, in fact, in process. And this was, in due course, published a two-volume biography of Whitfield by Arnold Dallimore, the first volume of which didn't come out until 1970. The second volume appeared ten years later in 1980. So, in a sense, it's waited all this time for a full, the first full biography of George Whitfield to appear for a long, long time. 
1960, Whitfield's Journal appeared, also published by the Banner of Truth Trust. So there is now literature available when at one time there was very, very little, and you could only really derive information by second-hand uh, methods, so to speak, by studying the biographies available of John Wesley. Now, why is it that uh, Whitfield, up until recently, was fairly unknown? In the foreword to the select sermons, this is what Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones had to say about Whitfield. Nothing has been sadder in the story of the last 50 years in the church, nor more significant than the way in which George Whitfield has been neglected, and especially as one considers the very considerable attention that has been given to his contemporary, John Wesley. This was certainly not the position 200 years ago, and it should not be the case now. Of all the men of the 18th century whom God raised up to do that marvelous work called the Evangelical Awakening, none was more remarkable than George Whitfield. Of few men can it be said that their preaching was apostolic in character, but it can certainly be said of Whitfield. His whole career from beginning to end was an amazing phenomenon, and his Herculean labors both in Great Britain and America can only be explained by the power of the Holy Ghost, hence that reading we had tonight. But Whitfield was not, the only, was not only the greatest preacher and orator of the 18th century, he was also one of its most saintly characters, if not the saintliest of all. Certainly there was no more humble or lovable man amongst them. What can be more profitable next to the Bible itself than to read something of the life of such a man and to read his own words? That's Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones' introduction then to the select sermons of George Whitfield. That should be a sufficient commendation for us this evening, the fact that the great Dr. Lloyd-Jones, who is now in the fellowship of Whitfield before the throne in glory, that he should recommend him in that particular manner. Now, there has been something of a sequence in all our lectures. And having looked at some of the Puritans, we then spent some time looking at that twilight period between the end of Puritanism and the dawn of the Evangelical Awakening. And that enabled us to look at the life and the ministry of Dr. Philip Doddridge of Northampton, who, in a sense, uh, was the product of the Puritan era, and yet at the same time, uh, he came into close fellowship with the men of the Evangelical Awakening. But what happened then between the end of the Puritan period and the beginning of the Evangelical Awakening in which someone like Philip Doddridge were called to minister? Well, very, very simply, following the Act of Uniformity of 1662, the Puritans were forced into the wilderness. Thus, nonconformity, as we have come to know it, began. Presbyterians Congregationalists, Baptists, and others suffered for their convictions. In the aftermath of the Civil War and Oliver Cromwell's protectorate, with king and church restored, the authorities were determined that religious enthusiasm should never be permitted to recur. The Church of England's alternative to fanaticism was a cool, intellectual, and moralistic religion which few people were interested in. King Charles II and his court encouraged loose living and open immorality. The new scientific movement undermined the Bible, an intellectual attitude which encouraged deism at the expense of biblical Christianity. Doctrinal error, for example, the denial of the Trinity and the, the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ, infected Anglicans and nonconformists alike. And by reference to that, you'll understand that nothing is ever new. Every century, there always have been the enemies of the biblical gospel. The more orthodox nonconformists developed a ghetto mentality in their struggle to keep the old cause of the gospel alive. It must be said that the likes of Isaac Watts, the hymn writer, and Philip Doddridge, they were exceptions to this general rule. They sought to break out of that cage that the sons of the Puritans had tended to get themselves into. In all this, the general state of society deteriorated. Sacred things were ridiculed by all classes of society, on the stage, in popular literature, in the coffee houses. Christianity was a thing of the past. 
much the same kind of feeling that you get on radio and television in the 1990s. Again, nothing is new. Needless to say, crime, corruption, and violence were on the increase. Such was the situation in Hanoverian England during the reigns of George I and George II. That covers the period from 1714 through to the 1720s and early 1730s. This was the situation then in which a wonderful event occurred, and that is the birth of George Whitfield. He was born on December the 16th, 1714, at the Bell Inn, Gloucester. Not a very likely birthplace for a preacher of the everlasting gospel. And yet why not? Because surely the gospel speaks of sinners saved by grace. But that perhaps is an interesting observation. His origins were therefore humble and hardly conducive to a virtuous upbringing. As poor as his widowed mother was, George was, as a son of Gloucester, entitled to a place at the Free Grammar School. And apart from occasional promptings of conscience, George confesses that he was, quote, addicted to lying, filthy talking, and foolish jesting, and that he was a Sabbath breaker, a theatre goer, a card player, and a romance reader. And it was because of these things that he was brought under conviction of sin. Perhaps many of these things would hardly create a ripple on many consciences today. What would Whitfield and his generation say about things that are permitted today? But this was his general lifestyle until he was about 15. However, George's youth was not entirely misspent. Although not brilliant academically, and that really explains why he became more of a preacher than a theological thinker, Although he wasn't brilliant academically, he made good progress at the grammar school. His particular gift was a remarkable memory and an, an astonishing gift of elocution. He was often used, chosen to recite before the mayor and corporation at the annual school speech days. Such was his powers of elocution and speech. George left school at 15 to assist his mother at the inn. But the business failed, and an old friend encouraged George to consider going to Oxford. So he renewed his studies at the grammar school. Funds were available for him to go to Oxford, so in 1732, George entered Pembroke College as a servitor. And a servitor was one who, as it were, paid his way through his college years by rendering certain services to others, those who were more privileged than he. This brought him, therefore, to, to Oxford and contact with the Holy Club and his conversion. Whitfield's time in Oxford proved the pivotal point of his life. There he met the brothers John and Charles Wesley, leaders of a group of students who met regularly to promote the spiritual life and engage in good works in the locality. The Holy Club had actually started in 1729 by Charles Wesley, and it was later taken over by his brother John. The disciplined life of the group earned them the nickname Methodists because of the method with which they organized their lives and their Christian service and their worship and their piety. It was strictly disciplined in stark contrast to the kind of undisciplined lifestyle of many of the students at that time. Although he considered he was living a true Christian life, he felt unhappy and unforgiven. He was troubled in his conscience. You see, he was religious, but he wasn't Christian. He was church-going, but unconverted. Then he became acquainted with the evangelical Christianity of the old Puritans in the writings of Henry Scougal, especially his remarkable little book, The Life of God in the Soul of Man, Richard Baxter, his call to the unconverted, Joseph Elaine's Alarm to the Unconverted, and, of course, the great Matthew Henry's commentary. In May 1735, after months of spiritual agony in prayer and study, George Whitfield experienced the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ with full assurance. And this is part of that memorable 
testimony that he made in his journal. He sums it up thus, the spirit of mourning was taken from me, and I knew what it was truly to rejoice in God my Savior, and for some time could not avoid singing psalms wherever I was. This led to his ordination and the commencement of the great Methodist revival. George Whitfield was ordained by Bishop Benson at Gloucester on Trinity Sunday, 1736, at the early age of 22. In this, the initiative had been taken by others who recognized Whitfield's piety and gifts. His very first sermon was preached at the church of St. Mary Le Crypt, Gloucester. And from the moment he opened his mouth, it was clear to all that the hand of God was upon this truly astonishing preacher. We should mention that he felt acutely unworthy of preaching the gospel. He was clearly ill at ease with himself, despite the blessing that had come into his life. Nonetheless, he opened his mouth and he preached. And there were tremendous, tremendous uh, consequences from this, his first sermon in Gloucester. And this is what he said about that first preaching occasion. He says, I trust I was enabled to speak with some degree of gospel authority. Some few mocked, but most seemed for the present struck. And I have since heard that a complaint was made to the bishop that I drove 15 mad the first sermon. The worthy prelate wished that the madness might not be forgotten before next Sunday. After his ordination, Whitfield returned to Oxford where he graduated B.A., he commenced his ministry at the Tower Chapel in London. He preached in a number of London churches where large crowds gathered to hear the young preacher. George Whitfield was nothing short of a sensation, and congregations were taken by storm. Never before had such fervent and powerful calls for sinners to repent and believe in Christ been heard in the Church of England. You see, the situation was, you see, that very largely the nonconformists had cooled down and they had crawled into a corner. They'd lost their sense of authority and urgency. In the Church of England, things were very low-key, laid-back, moralistic, and very quiet. So Whitfield was a sensation when he preached in these London churches, these Anglican churches. Many were awakened and converted. After spending a brief curacy in Dummer in Hampshire, Whitfield responded to an invitation from the Wesley brothers to visit Georgia. This involved assisting in the care of an orphan house in Savannah, something which Whitfield became responsible for for the rest of his life. So he sailed for Georgia in 1737. In fact, whenever he journeyed to Georgia, he would oversee the development of the orphan house. And when he returned to England, which he did on a number of occasions, uh, he would not only preach but also invite gifts for the orphan house in Savannah. So here was a gospel preacher who was also very concerned about the needs of, of poor orphans in uh, the United States as it was to become. But preeminently, George Whitfield became a field preacher. And why? Well, because his style wasn't acceptable in the Church of England. He returned from Georgia at the end of 1738 to receive priest's orders at the hands of Bishop Benson. By now, his reputation had changed completely. Many of the clergy had denounced him as a raving fanatic. They were scandalized that Whitfield should urge the necessity of loyal church people to be born again. They'd never heard this kind of thing. Pulpits were rapidly closed to this flaming evangelist who preached not the common errors of the day, mark you, but Christ's atoning death and the work of the Holy Spirit, good official Church of England teaching. The tragedy was that the clergy did not preach these things. They perhaps mumble through the liturgy, which contained many of these great truths. The 39 articles were tucked away in the back of the prayer book and largely forgotten. All Whitfield did was preach standard Reformation Anglican teaching. Unfortunately, there were elements in the Book of Common Prayer and the 39 articles which tended to deaden the evangelical features, which is a hangover really from the half completed reformation of the Church of England. But Whitfield was a very unconventional Anglican in one sense, but he was conventional in another sense, in that the Reformed Gospel 
of the Anglican Reformation was preached with power by him. Whitfield's rejection by the church authorities constrained him to preach beyond church walls in open public places. Thus began his remarkable career as a field preacher. Like his blessed master before him, Whitfield went out into the highways and byways compelling sinners to come in. His first open-air venture began at Bristol in 1739, when he preached to the colliers at Kingswood, as they came up out of the mines after the day's work was done. His activities becoming known, Whitfield preached at Hannam Mount to a congregation numbering thousands, the like of which never attended any church. Whitfield's account of the Collier's response is famous, and these are his words, his own journal account of what happened. Having no righteousness of their own to renounce, they were glad to hear of a Jesus who was a friend to publicans and came not to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. The first discovery of their being affected was the sight of the white gutters made by their tears, which plentifully fell down their black cheeks as they came out of their coal pits. Hundreds of them were soon brought under deep conviction, which, as the event proved, happily ended in a sound and thorough conversion. That was just the beginning of that tremendous movement which occupied much of the rest of the century. Two months later, on the 27th of April, 1739, Whitfield began field preaching in London, at Islington. During his prayer, he hadn't started preaching yet, but during his prayer, the church wardens demanded to see his license for preaching in London. Having been licensed to preach in the diocese of Bristol, the preacher was now obliged to vacate the church. Not to be deterred, Whitfield preached in the churchyard with astonishing effect. From then on, Whitfield preached regularly in the large open spaces of 18th century London. Moorfields, where the Eye Hospital now is, Kennington Common, Hackney Fields, Smithfield, Blackheath, and other places. It was not uncommon through the years for 30,000 people to gather together under the preaching of this Church of England preacher who had been driven out of her churches. Without microphones, without modern aids, he was able to preach in the way that he did. His voice was truly astonishing. So much so that uh, in later years when he was preaching for his friend, the Reverend William Grimshaw of Howarth in Yorkshire, out there on the moors, a lady could hear his voice two miles downwind and she was converted through that preaching. He had a truly astonishing voice, the like of which probably has never been heard before or since. The revival soon became international. Methodism became a nationwide phenomenon. George Whitfield and others preached the gospel with amazing success. Whitfield himself traveled the length and breadth of the land, preaching in Wales, Scotland, and Ireland to enormous crowds. Although Whitfield was the leading preacher of the movement, he was not alone. The brothers John and Charles Wesley also itinerated after their own conversion experiences in 1738, three years after Whitfield's. In other words, it was Whitfield who was raised up by God first. It was Whitfield who pioneered the open-air preaching of the gospel, not the Wesleys. Whitfield was the great pioneer. In Wales, God's servants were Daniel Rowland and Hal Harris, both converted in that remarkable year of 1735. And in the lecture on Jonathan Edwards, I had occasion to mention how remarkable this was. It was a sovereign work of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't some contrived campaign in the modern sense, because in that particular year, these men, quite unknown to one another, were converted and raised up in that astonishing revival. The New England revival, which broke out in 1735, Whitfield's conversion in England in that same year, and the conversion of Rowland and Harris in Wales, also in 1735. It was most remarkable. I've already mentioned William Grimshaw of Yorkshire, and also Henry Venn, who ministered the gospel powerfully in Huddersfield. Others, such as John Berridge, labored in Hertfordshire, William Romaine of Huguenot descent in London, 
and Samuel Walker in Cornwall. And all these great preaching heroes may be read about in that superb introduction to this whole subject, indeed the very best introduction to the evangelical revival that I've already mentioned, uh, J.C. Ryle's Christian Leaders of the 18th Century, and published by the Banner of Truth Trust. Others, too, were powerfully wrought upon by the Holy Spirit and used in the salvation of thousands. Thus, Methodism led to a widespread transformation of 18th century society. We've already noted Whitfield's visit to the New World. In all, he made seven visits, finally dying at Newburyport, Massachusetts in 1770. Thirteen sailings across the Atlantic. Thirteen in the primitive travel conditions of the time, surely reveal an intense dedication to the cause of Christ, not to forget considerable courage. If we remember the conditions had hardly changed from the days when the Pilgrim Fathers first set out for the New World uh, in 1620 in those leaky old boats of that period. Whitfield's influence was no less remarkable in America than it was in England. He proclaimed Christ and him crucified to huge crowds in Boston, New York and Philadelphia. He also met Jonathan Edwards preaching for him at Northampton and in the surrounding area during the New England Awakening in 1740. In Ian Murray's uh, biography on Jonathan Edwards, he gives a, a remarkable description of a preaching event where Whitfield was preaching. Uh, a local man was very anxious to go and hear Whitfield but he was not alone. And as one drew near to the place of the preaching, there was something like a dust storm to be seen for miles around. And as he drew close, there were hundreds and thousands of people making their way on foot, some riding as fast as they could on their horses and their ponies and carts in order to get to the appointed place for the preaching. And it was a most astonishing uh, experience, Whitfield's ministry there in New England. It's noteworthy that Benjamin Franklin, one of America's greatest statesmen, one of the founding fathers of the United States of America, who was also a notable scientist, though never seemingly converted, this is a mystery, he was never seemingly converted, but he heard Whitfield with pleasure. And on one occasion, because of the power of the preacher's voice, actually uh, went to the edge of the crowd and as far down the street in Boston as he possibly could. Uh, and he was amazed how clear the preacher's voice would carry. He expressed astonishment at the change in American society resulting from Whitfield's preaching. Franklin even published Whitfield's sermons in America. It's hardly surprising, duly considering Whitfield's influence, that he was eventually called the Apostle of the English Empire. He was also a preacher for all classes, there's no doubt that Whitfield's impassioned, powerful biblical preaching had a spellbinding effect on the common people. But he was no rabble-rouser. The nobility and the gentry also attended his preaching. Lord Bolingbroke and Lord Chesterfield delighted to hear him. Bolingbroke said, He is the most extraordinary man in our times. He has the most commanding eloquence I have ever heard in any person. David Hume, the historian and very sceptical philosopher, declared that it was worth going 20 miles to hear Whitfield preach. And that would be nothing, of course, in these days. Many people during Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones' ministry would drive much further in their cars to hear him preach. But in those days, that's quite a commendation. On one occasion, Whitfield's eloquence quite overcame Lord Chesterfield. As Whitfield illustrated a lost sinner's hopeless condition in terms of a blind beggar about to fall over a precipice, the noble Lord moved forward and exclaimed, He's gone! He's gone! He was completely taken up in the oratory. So vivid and powerful as it was. Most notable of Whitfield's supporters among the nobility was Selina, the Countess of Huntingdon. She was an influential woman of God in those tremendous times. And she was particularly instrumental in bringing many of her class to hear the gospel. In 1748, Whitfield actually became the chaplain of the Countess. 
Whilst many were impressed with the oratory of Whitfield, and there was something of nature in this, it's very obvious that Whitfield was equipped with an amazing gift of the Holy Spirit, as well as the gift of elocution. Probably the world has never seen his equal. He earned the unqualified admiration of the great Shakespearean actor David Garrick, who longed to be able to say, oh, just as Whitfield did. <laughs> Apparently he could never master it. Whitfield could raise tears just by the way he pronounced Mesopotamia. These are contemporary accounts. Yet this humble preacher consecrated his gifts to the service of the Lord Jesus Christ in the salvation of men and women. One particular conversion illustrates this perfectly. Whitfield had his enemies. That shouldn't surprise us. And one of them afterwards declared, and this is a delightful quote, I came to hear you with my pocket full of stones, intending to break your head. But your sermon got the better of me and broke my heart. And that kind of thing was duplicated across the country many, many times and in the New World. The fact remains that Whitfield preached with great compassion for sinners. He was a highly emotional preacher. He seldom preached without tears. What is remarkable about Whitfield is that all this attention, all this publicity, all this influence didn't go to his head. He remained a remarkably humble Christian. Whilst he preached powerfully and with deep emotion and compassion the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, he was also a very aggressive preacher. In other words, don't misunderstand the use of that word. He wasn't aggressive in the sense of uncompassionate, but in his method, in his method and his manner. He did not wait for people to come to church. He went after them. He brought the light of God's love and grace and holiness to the dark cities and villages of the land. And yet Whitfield was a most saintly, humble Christian. His success hardly altered him. Late in life, he declared, I now begin to begin to be a Christian. Not that he doubted his salvation, but that he always considered others more advanced than himself. If Whitfield was humble and forgiving, his heart was also all-embracing. He was no denominational party man. He loved all those who loved our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity and truth. He encouraged all who preached the gospel of God's grace in the Lord Jesus Christ, however they might differ on less essential matters of the faith. He did not resent the criticisms of other great men of God like Jonathan Edwards and Philip Doddridge, who both thought that the great evangelist was over-hasty in judging the spirituality of others and too prone to be led by spiritual impulses. An example of his humility is that um, he asked Philip Doddridge of Northampton to revise the pages of his journal with a view to another edition. Doddridge accepted the responsibility and it was a true act of friendship between men who were very similar in their disposition and their spirituality, their warmth. Doddridge, in brotherly love, gave Whitfield some faithful admonitions regarding the evangelist irregularities, which brought this characteristic reply from Whitfield. Alas, alas, how can I be too severe against myself, who, Peter-like, have cut off so many ears, and by imprudence mixed with my zeal, have dishonored the cause of Jesus? Assure yourself, dear sir, everything I print shall be revised. And that's a beautiful, humble statement by a great man of God, George Whitfield. Whitfield was thus a wonderful advertisement for his Lord. This is true in his cheerfulness, as well as his humility and catholicity of spirit. And this I find most remarkable and quite glorious, and if only there was more of this. Because one lady in New York refers to Whitfield's cheerfulness when she testified to God's gracious dealings with her soul. Mr. Whitfield was so cheerful that it tempted me to become a Christian. His labors, of course, were enormous. It's estimated that Whitfield preached about 18,000 sermons and never without effect. He had an immense pastoral following. 
banned from the established church, Whitfield erected in London a large wooden structure known as the Tabernacle, later replaced by Tottenham Court Chapel. In 1756, he was closely associated with the growth of Calvinistic Methodism in Wales, becoming its first moderator at Calfilly in 1743. He was greatly concerned with the training of gospel preachers, preaching at the opening of Trevecca College in South Wales in 1769. And this institution was intended to supply both branches of the Methodist movement, that is the Calvinistic and the Wesleyan or the Arminian. And this Catholicity of spirit was something very dear to Whitfield's heart. And I'll have occasion to discuss in, in, in a little while the Calvinistic theology of, of Whitfield. But this must be said that he was no party man. He loved John Wesley and as far as he possibly could, cooperated with him. But the problem very often was with the followers of the two men. The followers were worse than the leaders, so often this is the case. They often go, off, go to extremes that, which were never countenanced by the leaders. But on one occasion, uh, some strong-minded Calvinist followers of Whitfield asked him, um, do you expect to see Mr. Wesley in heaven? Expecting the answer. Well, it's very, very doubtful whether he'll be in heaven because he was an Arminian. He didn't preach free grace. But Whitfield's answer was characteristic. I don't think I will see him in heaven because he'll be much closer to the throne than I will be. That's characteristic of Whitfield's humility. He considered Wesley to be more godly than himself. Whitfield's life is summed up by 2 Corinthians 4, verse 5. We preach not ourselves, says the Apostle Paul, but Christ Jesus the Lord. He lived for one thing only, to preach the Lord Jesus Christ. This perhaps explains why he is generally forgotten. One of his favorite and characteristic expressions was, let the name of George Whitfield perish so long as Christ is exalted. So I think we'd have to say that he wouldn't really be overpleased that we were devoting this lecture to him tonight. But, as I said, with respect to John Calvin, who would have been of a similar disposition, Hebrews 11 justifies us giving attention to him because we are exhorted to remember the godly who have gone before in order that we, not fixing our eyes upon them, might run the race looking unto Jesus. And that's the sole reason why we're looking at these men, because they help us or should help us to look unto Jesus. For many, John Wesley and Methodism are the same thing. But this is not how matters were viewed years ago. There is some truth in the idea that Whitfield was Methodism's orator, John Wesley its organizer, and Charles Wesley its poet. Why then is Whitfield largely ignored? Probably because he never organized Whitfieldite churches in the way John Wesley's Wesleyan societies were. Now, in England, Methodism generally is Wesleyan. But in Wales, the term Methodism re refers to the Calvinistic Methodists. But what are, called West, uh, what are called Methodists in England are called Wesleyans in Wales. And there are other denominations as well. There is another denomination which came into being in the last century called the Wesleyan Reform Union. The point I'm making is, therefore, that there are many churches that adopted Wesley's name which have perpetua perpetuated his memory. But there are no such things as Whitfield churches. And that partly explains why he's been forgotten. Yet, the blind king George III, who reigned from 1760 to 1820, could say to Charles Wesley Jr., who was himself a gifted composer in his day, thought by Dr. William Boyce to be an English Mozart, <coughs> The blind king said to Charles Wesley, Jr., It is my judgment, Mr. Wesley, that your uncle and your father and George Whitfield and Lady Huntingdon have done more to promote true religion in the country than all the dignified clergy put together, who are so apt to despise their labours. Certainly Whitfield is worthy of the attention he has received in recent years. It cannot be ignored that despite a common Bible-based evangelicalism, the Wesley brothers did not see eye to eye with George Whitfield. They were Arminian, 
whereas Whitfield was a thoroughgoing evangelical Calvinist. Yet the illustrious trio were one at heart, if not in the head entirely. They were united on the central core of what we might call evangelical truths, namely total depravity and our sinful fallenness. They believed in the new birth. They believed in justification by faith. And they believed in the need for holiness. They believed these things. But they didn't entirely agree on some of the other truths of the gospel. A token of the bond which nonetheless existed between George Whitfield and John Wesley is the fact that Wesley preached Whitfield's funeral sermon in 1770. Now, the, the followers couldn't have understood this. And uh, the followers of, of Whitfield were not too happy that Wesley should be asked. But nonetheless, before he died, this was made known by Whitfield that he wished Wesley to preach his funeral sermon in England. And Wesley's tribute to Whitfield is probably the best and most fitting way to remember the great evangelist. Wesley said, Have we read or heard of any person who called so many thousands, so many myriads of sinners, to repentance? That's a commendation by Wesley the Arminian. Now I hope we've been able to get something of a grasp, therefore, of Whitfield's life preeminently an evangelist, a preacher of the gospel, a humble Christian follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, and his only concern was to preach that Christ might be known and not himself.